Good morning and welcome to our fifth Streaming Media Connect virtual event. I know we're all champing at the bit to get back to in-person conferences, but these virtual events have given us a great opportunity to keep the conversation going while we can't meet in person. Uh, talking about the most important topics in online video. And once again, we've got a great series of panels and presentations over the next three days. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I'm the editor and VP of Streaming Media and welcome. And if you're wondering, we are indeed all systems go at this point for Streaming Media West in Huntington Beach the first week of November. The program is live and we'll be adding speakers this week. So look for a link to the Streaming Media West website in the chat streamingmedia.com forward slash west if you prefer to get it via your ears rather than your eyes. This is also our fifth research keynote. Each year, Streaming Media and Unisphere Research do about a half dozen reader surveys in various topics. And we do those with the help of Tim Siglin from the Help Me Stream Research Foundation. And he's also a contributing editor for Streaming Media. And Tim, you've been with us since pretty much the beginning, haven't you? I think so. Yeah, it's. Um... I think I'm celebrating my 23rd year in streaming now, so it feels All like All right. It. Well, good to see you again. You are a regular fixture everywhere streaming media is. So thanks for joining us for this research keynote. This topic, uh, this time, the topic is content and revenue protection, and our industry partner has been Easy DRM. And Olga Kornienko from Easy DRM is joining Tim and I to talk about the results of the survey Content and Revenue Protection 2021 for the next hour. Olga, welcome. How are you? Good. Thank you, Eric. Uh, morning, Eric. Morning, Tim. Morning, everybody. Um, I'm doing very well. Thank you for having us. Good. You look like you're in an actual office rather than a home office. Well, I kind of had to. I have a dog that chooses to bark at the most inopportune times, and I figured <laughs> life would just be easier if he wasn't barking in the background. Yeah, I can't guarantee that mine won't, although I think I've made it through... Well, four Streaming Media Connects now without too many dog interruptions, but I probably shouldn't have said that. But Exactly. Anyway. Let's knock on wood. <laughs> right, exactly. So we will be talking about the content protection and revenue, content and revenue protection survey for the next hour. If you have any questions for Tim or Olga, please put them in the Q&A tab rather than in the chat. And uh, we will turn to those questions throughout the conversation as they come in at appropriate moments, and then we'll finish them off at the end. So please put your questions there. Also, if you are here today and if you stay till the end, you're eligible to win a $50 Amazon gift card. You must, however, be present to win. So we'll be picking a name at random from the attendee list at the end of the hour. So shall we jump in? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. All right. So again, Content and Revenue Protection 2021 sponsored by Easy DRM. We've already introduced ourselves. There's our headshot, so you can look at our lovely faces twice this morning. Tim, could you start talking a little bit about the, the demographics of the survey to sort of set the stage for the results that we're going to talk about afterwards? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, as, as Eric mentioned, this is our fifth um, research keynote that we've done. And one thing we really like to do is get a sense from respondents is, to what industry they self-identify with. Because as we know with streaming, it's not just about those of us here in the industry, it's about those that we serve and what market verticals they're in. So I know this is a bit of an eye chart, but um, essentially the some of the highlights here are, we have, a, we have everything from news organizations and finance, uh, financial services to education to sort of classic channels, as well as OTT pure play, um, and even a decent number of religious organizations. And what's rising across some of the last few has been online betting, uh, gambling, and sports book. So that, that's a good sort of overview. I will say one other, one other demographic is um, this was about 75% North America about 18% Europe and the rest covered the rest of the world. And Tim, how does that compare with uh, the demographics for our surveys that we've done over the last year and a half? It's fairly consistent. So what I like about that is this says same, not, it's not the same people. What we can actually see from the email addresses people put in, but same demographic makeup that we've had on, on previous surveys. Okay, great. And uh, apologies, Olga, for briefly giving away the big reveal, 
but uh, maybe you can talk about the, one of the biggest findings that came out uh, of this survey as I move to the next slide. Well, we often hear about all the you know amount of money that has been lost to video piracy, and at times we hear numbers, you know, X amount of money being lost to piracy over the course of the year in this industry or that industry. But according to the survey, it basically amounts to 20% of a company's revenue, which it's kind of, I think, huge if you think about it for a second, um, because say, hearing that $55 billion is lost to piracy is a very abstract number. But 20% kind of makes things and puts them into perspective. And you can think about your own company and say, what is 20% worth to me? And taking money out of the equation, it's I was thinking about it from a perspective of giving everybody Wednesday off and still paying for it. Like, why, why, why is basically the question that comes to mind and what can we do about it? Exactly. Uh, I, I really like the fact that, as you said, you, we, we, you put this into a percentage rather than an abstract number that's hard for us to to get our heads around. Um, Tim, how, you know, you've, you've done a fair amount, we've done a fair amount of research into revenue over the last year and a half with these streaming media surveys. Um, do you have any thoughts you wanna to add to, to, to this? Yeah, I'd say two things. One, revenues obviously have gone up dramatically. So if, if we're thinking about what 20% was a year and a half ago versus what 20% is now, I think when the next round of figures come out, it's going to be a sizably higher number than the billions of dollars that, that Olga mentioned. The other thing is, this is the average. So we had, you know, we had some people who said zero, and we left those in because we wanted those to be accurate. And some of those were religious organizations or educational institutions. But then we also had others that legitimately, and, and I cross-checked this because I wanted to be sure, but legitimately we're losing 70 to 75% of their revenue to piracy. That seemed to center in some areas in Latin America, um, but so it wasn't quite as high in North America, but still it was enough to, to drive the average up to, to 20%. So I, I think that's key to understand that this is the average, which means in some businesses, 40% would not be unheard of. Absolutely. And if you think back to the demographics that we showed, as you said, Tim, we've got uh, everything from large media and entertainment companies to religious organizations and educational organizations. And one of the things we discovered was that, you know, people might have the misconception that it's only media and entertainment companies that are losing revenue big time. And we've had some discussions uh, as we prep for this call um, where we talk about the fact that educational institutions more and more are protecting their video and they're losing revenue as well um, if that video gets out. So it's not just the usual suspects or what we think are the usual suspects who are, who are losing revenue. And let me add one thing to that, Eric. I delved into the traditional media companies. Theirs was closer to the average. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a few media companies that actually reported up to 30% revenue loss. So again, if we're growing streaming as a whole and we're bleeding money from piracy, then obviously content revenue protection are a, a key topic. Yeah, and I've at some point, I've uh, actually listened to a presentation at one of the uh, streaming media events that was done by educational facilities that spoke about the amount of effort and the amount of money that is being put in to record all the video and all the redundant, you know, um, infrastructure and whatnot that is done to record classes. And they said that they don't use anything to protect the content afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I just, I don't understand because it's such a, it's such a, a vital source of revenue for institutions to be able to offer this as videos for people who can't be on Canvas. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Let's move on to the next slide and talk a little bit about the mix of live and on-demand. Tim, again, talk about this and how it compares to some of our previous surveys. So this is, this is interesting. Um, we looked specifically at this question with those people who in the survey said, yes, we make revenue off of online video. So if we take everybody who took the survey, um, including those 
institutions that may not make money off of it. It was split 50-50. If, if we took those who made online revenue, we can see on demand is slightly higher. And Olga, I think I remember when we had a conversation about this a few days ago, you said that you all are seeing a trend during COVID toward more on demand. Is that accurate? Well, uh, with COVID, it was pretty much uh, kind of, we were forced into more of an on-demand situation, mostly because we couldn't have live events. But it, we've also noticed a lot of uh, companies changing gears, companies that were doing live things like film festivals of some persuasion or something. They were switching to an on-demand situation where they had to um, come up with an alternative and um not stream events live or somehow figure out how to make revenue. So um, yes, that was definitely the trend. We'll see what happens now with um, the world coming back to somewhat of a, a new norm or if we wanna keep using that expression, but um, we'll see what happens this way. And it's, it was actually interesting because conferences like our industry conferences are starting to look into a hybrid model, which would also be very interesting to see if they're looking to start offering content in both virtual and um, in-person type um, offerings. Good. Absolutely. Our next couple of slides talk about devices and operating systems. Tim. Yeah. So um, on this this next slide, we look at the um, we look at the scenario that we looked at in our last research keynote, where we asked. Uh, respondents to tell us how they personally consume content and how they consume content at the office. <clears throat> Not really a surprise here in the fact that business and professional is dominated fully by desktop and laptop. But the big point on this particular one is if you see the way personal consumption is handled, it, it's spread across to, um, you know, as a minority desktop and laptop, and then you've got the combination of everything else from gaming consoles, OTT boxes, smartphones, tablets, etc. That means there are a whole lot of attack vectors uh, that are potentially there when you put content out. So while you may look to protect your content sort of on the desktop and laptop, the moment that you push it out toward a consumer, consumers are going to want to watch it on the device they have on hand, and that creates an even bigger challenge for, you know, for content and revenue protection. And for us, from a DRM perspective, it just goes to show for us that you need to be able to either make a business decision of, I am not going to stream to smart TVs, but then as we see from this chart, you're losing what, about 15, 20% of your, um, streaming revenue to because you're choosing not to support a device or you need to actually make decisions about which technologies and which devices you're supporting and this is actually a very interesting um, graphic that shows that you pretty much if you want to be um, competitive you have to support everything and then to the next slide eric which sort of fits nicely with this one you know it's the question around what operating systems people use um and again uh business not really that surprising although the the mac os level seems to be a little higher than normal we saw that trend during the enterprise video survey research keynote that we did a few months ago um, i think we're seeing it here but when you again when you look at personal you've got a whole bunch of different operating systems that you have to deal with and, and again olga that sort of points to multiple attack vectors and, and limitations that people with content may, without thinking, say they don't want to support a particular operating system, that means they're gonna lose revenue. Exactly. We do get people who say, well, we don't you know, wanna support a specific browser or a specific device. And I think this just illustrates perfectly well that every single operating system is important and you have to support everything. So let's take a look now at what people are using to protect their content. Um, Olga, Tim, uh, which one? You, uh, Tim, I think you're going to start with this one, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly touch on this. I mean, Olga's the expert in this part, but but DRM is the thing that we all sort of have come to know and love or hate, depending on which side of the equation that you're on. Um, 
what's interesting is the amount of uh, invisible watermarking, which is great from a forensic standpoint, but is that really a deterrent to, you know, to people sharing content? Um, and then also a reliance on sampling or fingerprinting services like YouTube Content ID. I mean, Olga, DRM is in your name, so obviously, you know, rights management is is a big part of it. But does anything surprise you on this chart? Well, I think we'll get more into. Um, actually, no, honestly, no. At this point, absolutely not. We'll get more into um, the need for and the desire for geofencing. I think down and the love and hate of geofencing further down in the uh, presentation. But no, absolutely not, because I think digital rights management and watermarking go hand in hand absolutely perfectly. And I think they complement each other very well. So no, uh, this is exactly what we're seeing in the industry. Now, we did have a, a question from the audience um, that somebody said, why would you even attempt DRM when you can simply record a PC screen with HD or better quality? I mean, we, we can hold that till we get to the myths of DRM or we can talk about it now. Well, I think it depends on uh, the type of recording you're talking about. Um, I mean, I will admit, and I start most conversations with clients right away that there's absolutely nothing in this world that will prevent somebody from putting a phone or a camera in front of another camera and recording everything that's on the screen. And it, that is you, the content you expect to consume, then, um, then that's perfectly fine that what you're gonna watch is a recorded part of the content. Outside of that, there are um, output protection levels that can prevent um, screen capture. It depends on the device, it depends on uh, the player. You can do certain things in browsers and you cannot do certain things in browsers depending on what you're trying to achieve. So it is, um, DRM does prevent a lot, a good amount of screen capture. It just depends on the device playing back the content. Okay, good. That, that's a good clarification on that. Eric, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, let's dig down a little further into the, the types of DRM people are using. So um, let me jump. Here, sorry, I'm trying to keep track. So, fair play, uh, top of the list, actually tied with Widevine, um, and then Play Ready coming in third. Um, we talked a little bit about visible and forensic watermarking before. Olga, again, any surprises on this particular one? Is it surprising that fair play is so high? Because it, in years past, it had been much lower than Play Ready and Widevine. Well, actually, absolutely not. At this point, the two more co the two requests that we mostly get will be we need fair play and wide vine um, for reasons that obviously we need to address from a previous slide. Uh, play ready has taken a little bit of a hit, uh, mostly because people are using either the um, Chrome browser or the um, any any sort of an Apple device. And in our world, we are an SDK less. Uh, company, so we recommend going native technology to native device. Uh, and given the popularity of devices, this absolutely perfectly makes sense. Um, it is also interesting to see that ClearKey is making some sort of a dent, we'll call it that, um, because at the end of the day, it is the device that drives um, the technology you're using. And let's say for anybody who was streaming uh, content, the like 360 content, uh, to a, um, an Oculus device, virtual reality, anything, that device only supports ClearKey. And mm -hmm. there was no other way to stream any other, any other DRM technology to that. Um, it is also interesting, you said that the uh, percentage of people that did the survey was mostly US because it is very surprising to see um, Wiseplay make an appearance on this list at such a percentage. Very true. Um, real quick for the audience, for some who may not be familiar, could you just give a quick synopsis on sort of the differences between fair play and widevine? I know Apple famously years ago had a hard lock on content where you couldn't share it. And then Steve Jobs pushed to allow for fair play, which allowed you to share it to a certain level. Um, widevine obviously seems to be a, a much more traditional sort of hard lock, but can you give just a quick synopsis of either the top two or the top three? Well, at this point, um, 
most technologies do roughly the same thing. I mean, there's some minor variations of what you can and cannot do from a perspective of, um, and I guess it's more driven based on device, uh, whether or not you can do output protection levels as I've met, briefly mentioned. But at the end of the day, most um, technologies are the same, uh, with the exception being that when you are, if you are a um, DRM provider like us, um, Google and Microsoft give you, give us the play ready certificates that we need to issue out um, licenses and generate keys. Whereas play ready and Apple dictate it in a different direction. They require um, content owners and content providers to actually get that same certificate. Uh -huh. But outside of that, from a perspective of um, technology itself, they are roughly the same and they work the same and um, they are geared towards their own specific device. So PlayReady works uh, much better on a Windows device, Widevine on a Chrome device, uh, no, Google uh, device, Android device, and then FairPlay for an Apple device. Right. Olga, let me just ask real quick, when you say it works better on those devices, what happens on the devices where it doesn't work as well? Well, I say works better from a perspective of, and this is the reason why we chose to go SDK less, is that it takes out a level of complexity. Um, logic being that if Microsoft pushes out an update to the operating system, to the browser, to anything, they would test play ready as well. And the moment they push out a new update, first of all, it is obviously always backwards compliant. And second of all, to add any new features or any new modifications does not require our clients to do anything. Doesn't require them to update um, an SDK, doesn't require any sort of work. It requires work on our backend to implement all the features, but once they're implemented, it's also very seamless. And it also takes away time that you would normally spend trying to add extra levels of development. So for me, I think it works better solely because it takes away unexpected issues, glitches, and complexities. And I would add to that, uh, Eric, that the SDK list is a smart move because a lot of SDKs aren't very well documented and the SDK tends to come out after the operating system update. So there's this lag of a, a couple of weeks to a couple of months sometimes even. So. All right, very good. Let's move on to the next slide. And, and uh, we have a number of slides in this presentation in all of our, our research uh, where we take verbatim quotes from some of the respondents and we call it in their own words. And here we asked people, what are the features and benefits of content protection that, uh, that most appeal to you? So Olga, uh, you can talk about these. Well, um, obviously as a DRM provider, I say DRM, obviously, first and foremost. Um, and as I've mentioned before, I believe watermarking is a, um, a great complement to DRM because I genuinely believe that, um, and when I talk about piracy, I talk about people sharing content, not um, consuming it. From mostly, that's kind of how I look at it. And I mean, unless the screen is blatantly blinking, this content was licensed to Olga Kornienko, social security number, blah, there's not really much that's gonna stop me from sharing it. And if you're a consumer and you're consuming content and all of a sudden it appears something like this content was licensed to, I don't know, Delta, because we've all seen that on the planes, um, you kind of go, okay, whatever. And you continue watching. But I feel like watermarking is, so in my opinion, doesn't really prevent you, physically stop you from sharing. But it was absolutely helpful in tracking down who share content and actually taking down the content. Um, so that is a perfect compliment and I've seen it work together a lot. Um, people said that they want to, that they want to test the product. And I do take the approach that you should be able to test the product. You should be able to understand all the features and technologies. And, um, this is why we do offer test accounts for people who want to play with the technology and understand it. And I fully support testing each feature and from a consumer perspective, understanding it. Um, people like to say, people say that they like uh, keeping access to the, be very patron friendly. And as we've seen on a previous chart or on a previous chart below, above, um, we can see that there's a number of devices out there. And those are the devices that drive the type of DRM technology you should use. 
And, you know, we have clients all over the world where we're still supporting um, smooth streaming because people have old TVs that need to have smooth streaming on them. And that's kind of what you want out of a company is to make sure that they do do that for you and not just say, no, we only support A, B, and C and everybody else. Well, good luck with that. They should upgrade because, I mean, let's pause and think about how old our TVs are. And when was the last time you bought a new TV? And if you just bought one because of whatever, then how old was the previous TV, right? Um, people always also worry about latency with DRM. But if, um, you know, if it, you're using a good player that goes out and acquires a DRM license just as it's downloading the first few chunks of the video, you would never, never know that there's DRM on content and you would never notice latency. Um, sub 200 milliseconds is what our personal um, latency is on a DRM license. Most segments are second, two seconds long. So by the time it starts to play, you already have your license and licensing isn't a problem usually. And um, people want to always monetize from ads and I fully support that. And I do know people who apply DRM to their ads in order to make sure that um, their ads are not actually ripped out by a um, ad removing software. And um, sometimes I've seen content be resold with different ads, which DRM would also prevent that. And um, I actually would like to um, promote that idea as well because we've seen it work successfully with clients. Yeah, and especially as, you know, with the, the trend that we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months with the increased embrace of ad-supported video, clearly DRM protecting advertising content and its value is going to become increasingly important, has become important already. So, uh, yeah, people typically don't think of, of DRM as something that, that comes as much into play when there's uh, advertising, but it's every bit as important and can be applied in, in all sorts of unique ways. Going back to the beginning of the presentation, again, that 20% number talking about the, the average revenue that's lost. Let's dig down into the, the types of ways that uh, organizations lose revenue. Um, and Tim, do you want to start talking through these? Yeah, I do. Let me let me make a comment, though, on the ad supported. Um, if you want to see how big a deal ad supported is, not just for video, but for almost all websites with premium content, and I mean news, news sites as well, open up DuckDuckGo um, as your primary browser on a, you know, Android device or an iOS device. Every third site you hit is going to say, oh, you got to disable your ad blocker, um, you know, and it's gotten so, so bad from the consumer standpoint where they're trying to protect privacy um, and balance that with the ad supported revenue that, that I think that's going to continue to increase. As you said, Eric, we're, we're reliant more and more on ad supported video content. So that, that hasn't necessarily come heavily over into the video side. I mean, with something like DuckDuckGo, you can still watch content that has ads with video, but I suspect there's also gonna be that continuous yin and yang in browsers where if someone can figure out how to stop the video ads from playing and just watch the content, you know, then, then obviously that battle continues. And I think we've had that battle since the beginning of streaming. We're gonna to continue to have that battle back and forth not all content is free, nor should it be. Um, so hence the reason for what we were talking about there. All right, I'm off that. Now I'm on to the slide that you you actually um, want me to talk about, which is, it, it, so if we, if we look at issues here around losing online video revenue, we ask people to rank the causes uh, of, their, um, uh, of their loss of online video revenue from top to bottom. Number one, still subscriber churn, but number two, and this goes to DRM issues, is geographic issues. Um, what's interesting to me as you come down through the middle of this chart is organized and individual piracy fell in the middle of the rankings, but they fell very consistent to each other. And we tend to think of individual scale piracy as not being that big a deal we're more concerned with you know 
is somebody ripping off an entire library and then offering it on their own website. But it's clear here that individual scale piracy is also a, uh, you know, a problem for our respondents. Um, and then authentication. And I think authentication goes a little beyond sort of the traditional DRM, but we've seen a number of events, especially pay-per-view events recently where revenues had to be given back because the authentication systems didn't work properly. Olga, what are your thoughts on this slide? Well, I, I actually, I honestly wouldn't know about subscriber churn, uh, but I do think that for starters, a lot of those issues can be addressed with DRM um, and watermarking to an extent, especially authentication issues. I mean, there's absolutely no reason why you can't force people to do dual authentication or send some sort of a code somewhere. And it only takes a minute. And I think we're all getting more and more used to the idea of um, having dual authentication. And I feel like, yes, I mean, I'll, I'll state this as a consumer. Yes, it is annoying. But at the end of the day, um, if I know that I am paying for a subscription service and nobody else is attaching to it, then yes, I will go through the motions of doing dual authentication. And I think DRM is flexible enough where you can set any business rule and any business model and address a good amount of these issues. Very good. And the next slide, you know, it's 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 always interesting when we talk to people who uh, who work in the DRM industry or the broader streaming industry, because even Olga, you said yes, I admit this is annoying, right? Um, we we put our consumer hats on uh, at, at at different times, and as then we put our industry hats back on. Uh, but DRM, probably more than any other technology in, in our industry, um, has both positive perceptions and some negative perceptions. We'll get to the negative perceptions and uh, we call them myths you'll see in a few minutes. But first let's talk about the positive perceptions that people have about content protection. Well, yeah, sure. unfortunately DRM is one of those things that people love to hate and hate right. to love and every which way you wanna look at it. But um, we, were, we did ask three questions that were positive to DRM and three questions that were negative to DRM. And ironically enough, people strongly agreed with all of them. Um, we'll get to the, uh, the negative ones down the line, but anytime I think about any of these questions, I, part of me goes back to the 20% number. Uh, you're losing 20% of your revenue. So, um, has content piracy had a significant impact on my revenue? Yes, obviously it's 20% on average, give or take. So with people saying that DRM has had a positive impact on them, it's actually pretty good to hear from a DRM provider perspective and from the, we've always been told we're useless perspective because <laughs> you'd be surprised how many people come up to you and go, oh, you're a DRM provider. Let me tell you what I think about you. Um, well, look, I mean, the very first question we had in this uh, in this session was why bother, right? Someone can steal it anyway. So Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And um, I think it's a question, We've had experience with customers who've tried various different things with various um, approaches to DRM. And when they actually came to us and implemented our system, they said, wow, that was easy. And it's kind of funny that we named the company that way and they weren't trying to be kitschy, but it was a pause of, oh, and it just works. And wow, it just works. So um, as I've said before, DRM and watermarking go hand in hand together and they're both significant useful tools to um, stop piracy and stop content from being stolen on one hand and then track it down if um, it is stolen but it is obviously there are enough people in the industry that do agree with the fact that it is a useful tool and go back to that 20 percent again well, so I would say on this if you look if you look at that middle one using DRM has a significant positive impact 60 percent agree or, uh, or strongly agree to that. Um, that's even more than people who say content piracy has a significant impact on, on my streaming revenue. So again, remember this sort of takes the whole of, of the respondents, um, but the fact that you had 60% saying it has a significant positive impact is a win I think for DRM because in the past, even those who implemented it would tend to say, 
oh, I hope it's not going to bother my my patrons so much that they're not going to want to go through those annoying steps <laughs> like that. Um, right. Yeah. And, and I would say the those two, the first two questions combined show that it's working, right? Because the people, if 60% say that using DRM has a, a positive impact, well, then maybe content piracy doesn't have the significant impact that it would have had they not been using DRM. So, Exactly. And I think the more... Um, the more devices get streamlined because I mean, if we look back 10 years, there were more options for DRM technologies that were, and there was the device map was a lot broader. Uh, and now with um, uh, comp And it, life just becomes simpler. That's a really good point. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, Tim, you want to kick off this one with why yeah. we asked this question and what the implications are? Sure. So we're always interested when we look at things like traditional video platforms or enterprise video platforms to understand just what, um, where the public facing, consumer facing platforms fit. And in this, we said, we asked whether organizations video revenue model used any of the following as a distribution platform. You notice on the slide we had previously where we talked about um, fingerprinting services and it mentioned YouTube's content ID. Clearly that's good enough for a group of our respondents because we have a significant number who use YouTube. Um, so for them, they're essentially reliant on what's happening on YouTube and what YouTube is doing to protect. Now, what YouTube's doing to protect is somewhat of a mystery because they're sort of opaque from that standpoint. And I can say that as an industry analyst. Facebook, um, and I think we saw also on these top two ones, YouTube and Facebook, we saw during the, um, the lockdowns especially, houses of worship and other groups who might use music that they had actual licensed to were having problems with getting takedown notifications or automatic takedowns because of the fact that the algorithms themselves within YouTube and Facebook weren't updated to deal with that. So that that's an area where a not fully thought out DRM solution causes more problems than it's worth. Um, but having said that, YouTube, Facebook, obviously Twitter, um, Surprisingly to me, LinkedIn um, in some of our previous surveys has been third, but it's fairly close neck and neck to, uh, to Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, Olga, your, your thoughts about sort of the way DRM's handled on some of these big platforms and whether it's okay just to rely on those platforms for content protection? Well, I think that everybody should do their own research as far as what content protection is used on any platform as you correctly said that um, YouTube is kind of opaque about it. And um, to be brutally honest, I feel like when you stream to things like Facebook and Twitter, you're trying to reach a broader audience where if you want your videos shared, you want them shared on YouTube and Facebook because if you start applying DRM to a video you post on YouTube and over, or on Facebook and then somebody shares it and then the next thing you see is you can't view this content because of who you are or because you're not friends with so-and-so, it becomes frustrating if you, A, want to view it and B, if the point is to share. So I feel like all those more of the social, th those are more social media places where you want them shared. Hmm. Having said that, um, open YouTube and type in, I don't know, what do I watch? History Channel of the Universe, and you will get 12 versions of the same video and various permeations, um, which obviously means that History Channel lost rights to that video at some point, and it is being shared somehow. Um, so you, I feel like whatever you're doing, you have to make sure you do your research and know what is being done and decide whether or not you're okay with that. So two other quick comments on this too, as I was thinking, you mentioned 
opening the the search in YouTube and looking for something. Um, just anecdotally, when the UEFA Cup 2020 kicked off last month or the month before, um, there were a whole number of people on YouTube offering to let me watch the opening game in Rome. And then I think the second game was in Moscow. Um, I just flipped through all those to see whether any of those were legit. I found one who actually was broadcasting the game. All the rest of them are essentially just using it as feeders into their own site to say, oh, hey, come watch it on, on our particular site. The other thing I'd say on that is if you go to Google and do a video search, um, you know, of course, YouTube videos come up in that. And then others like VK, Daily Motion, a few others will come up. On a number of those now, when you click on, say, Daily Motion, it won't let you watch it just in the search window. It actually has a little uh, tag that says, this video can't be viewed here. Click through to watch it on the original site. So that is a, a, a level of interesting DRM or, or content, sorry, revenue protection that YouTube seems to be implementing into searches now as well. Yeah, and that makes sense because once you have people on your site, you can run ads, you can do whatever you got to, I mean, then it becomes a whole other thing of being able to prove that people saw those ads. But um, yeah, that, that definitely is a way to drive revenue. So we had a question from the audience um, that said, um, why not just state the video is watermarked and not bother with DRM if it's going to be stolen? at least it can be tracked back. So why not just focus on theft detection and watermarking? And you sort of alluded to that, Olga, that there's almost nothing that will keep people from taking content that's even visibly watermarked as opposed to invisibly watermarked. Um, are there some content owners who say, look, it's fine by me if I just track down who stole my stuff as opposed to actively trying to keep it from being stolen? Well, I think it all comes back to choice and what makes sense for you and your business. Um, if you want to put an effort into just watermarking content and then tracking it down, that's your choice. If you want to DRM protect it and um, spend less time tracking it down, that's also your choice. Um, I look at it from two perspectives. I look at it on one hand from a perspective of a... Um, consumer, where if I really, really, really wanted to see some movie that wasn't available, or I couldn't get to or whatever the story was, and I could download it. And I could watch it with the words of this movie's license to Tim Siglin, then I really wouldn't care. Um, because the idea would be to watch a movie and then talk about it. Right. And just know what happened. With that said, if I care about higher quality content, then you have to search for that. And that becomes a whole different story. Um, but I think it's a choice from A, um, the business that wants to either put effort into A or B, and then from a consumer and knowing your consumer, are they going to care if it's visibly watermarked or forensically watermarked and so on and so forth. Fair point. All right. We talked a few moments ago about positive perceptions of content protection, but there's lots of myths out there and we hit on those in the next few questions. So Olga, walk us through these and perhaps bust these myths. Sure, and I'm, I'm glad we called them myths. Um, the first one that people strongly agreed with seemed to be that using DRM complicates the streaming workflow. And as I've, I mean, I personally haven't seen it, um, partially because we've structured our service where it is completely, totally non-invasive. Um, and it works with the companies a CRM to make sure that the, pe the people that are allowed to view the content can get the license and also works with their um, encoding process to just pull keys at DRM, protect the content. So I have heard of people who've came to us and said, hey, we've been trying to use so-and-so's DRM services for four months and we've been unsuccessful. Please help. Can you do better? And they called us back three days later and said, we're done. We're confused. We don't know why it works. Why was it so simple? So I think it depends on what you come across and um, your experience, but I've personally seen it get implemented pretty smoothly. At least that's how we build our company. Um, using DRM would restrict the consumer device types uh, my service can reach. 
Well, let's refer to what was it, slide eight, where we had a list of devices that um, people are currently using. And then we had a list of technologies that address those devices. And if you use a multi-DRM solution, that would definitely address all of those devices and it would address that problem. Um, because at this point with the industry and the market being so narrow and basically down to Apple, Google, Microsoft and um, Huawei, it's four devices, four technologies, um, two streams, Dash and HLS, and that's it. And you're streaming Dash and HLS regardless. So I don't understand why people would believe that. That might be an older perception when there were more technologies and the market was more out, but I feel like hasn't been the case. And uh, use of DRM, my service with no associated benefit. Um, I said this a couple of times today, but let's refer to slide four. Um, if you believe that DRM costs you more than 20% of your, um, then you're probably not doing it right. So um, decide what's more important for you, 20% of your revenue or the cost that it would cost you to implement and save, I don't know, 18% of your revenue um, and take it from there. And I want to reiterate the point you made about the middle one here, Olga, multi-DRM takes care of this issue. In the past, it sort of was an all or nothing. You, you know, you went fully into the Microsoft camp or you went fully into the Widevine camp or the Apple camp. That's the benefit of having services that allow you to do multiple DRMs. Plus the legacy is, as we talked about on that particular slide where you've got AES-128, ClearKey and some others, that allows you to deal with the long tail. Um, that content we could maybe argue is not as protected as it is through some of those other services, but ultimately you've got a lot fewer long tail legacy devices out there viewing the content to begin with. Well, yeah, and as we go, you know, move further and further, as I mentioned, people would continue to upgrade their CDs and um, Oculus will probably start supporting a DRM technology of some sort um and the content is you know but that happens when it becomes more and more popular and people start to say hey i want to stream the olympics again on uh in vr but i don't want to have everybody steal it so let's see what we can do to protect it and basically with all drm devices drive the demand um, we have uh, WisePlay implemented in our services, and we know that it's not going to be used in the U.S. because you don't have, you know, enough devices in um, the U.S. that need WisePlay. With that said, going to an Asia market, it's one of the questions that comes up. Do you guys support Huawei and WisePlay? And yeah, we do, because, I mean, Huawei is one of the biggest mobile uh, device manufacturers out there. And just because it hasn't penetrated the U.S. doesn't mean it's not everywhere else. So they would drive the demand of all the um, technologies that are out there. And just remind me, Common Encryption Scheme had multiple DRM solutions in it, one of which was Marlin, which was sort of a European-focused open source. Um, are you saying across the board that the Common Encryption Scheme has pretty much just fallen to being wide vine and maybe one or two others as opposed to the entire five that were well um sorry for interrupting um at this point common encryption that we support actually supports three drm technologies we support wide vine and play ready and uh wise play since it's also running off of dash okay got it. um fair play is right now in its own camp and it will um they're working towards some sort of a, uh, I'm going to say some sort of a uh, communication integration with CMAF. Um, it will, you're still going to be looking at um, two manifests, but the DRM side of it would get easier uh, with, with CBCS and CBC encryption. And um, you are looking at an easier DRM solution, so to say, and more key sharing and whatnot. Um, but at this point, the I'm gonna say the three primary technologies everywhere are Play Ready and Widevine that go over common encryption over Dash and Fair Play over HOS. Okay, got it. 
Very good. Eric, I know we're sort of short on time, so I guess we probably ought to click through. We'll yeah, come back. and, uh, you know, we can move on to sort of looking at the future and the features that uh, people are looking for in content protection that may not be there yet or that they at least may not know about yet. So let's move on to that next slide. So in yep. this, but go ahead. You know, it's interesting. This is a slide I actually wanted to do and I actually wanted to see because this is an interesting slide for me. Um, this was my baby, so to say, um, because I am, as a person, just like most of us who travel a lot for work, uh, get to a different geographical location and we can't view the content we've downloaded or we can't view the content that we would normally have access to in the US. And that's kind of a, a major pet peeve for me, mostly because you want to see the content you want to see, right? And I find it very, very interesting that from a personal perspective, we want to be able to view our content abroad, be it purchased, be it subscribed to, be it whatever it is. Yet when we were talking about important features on the business side, people wanted more, more and more geo-blocking. Mm -hmm. And I find it very interesting that our personal wants and our business needs or business structures do not coincide with one another which is the other big eye-opening thing in the survey that we did is why are we not thinking about what the consumers want? Why are we trying to push a business model that the businesses say we should like, whereas as the consumers, we want something completely different. And I would say having experienced the same thing as you when you want to view your content abroad, I did an article on this a couple of years ago because both Netflix and Amazon Prime, I couldn't view the content. The response we got back um, when I went through, you know, the process as a journalist was, well, we don't have rights to show that content abroad. But some of that content was Amazon original content or Net Netflix original content. And it finally dawned on me, I was in Turkey, and it turned out that orange is the new black, even though it's a Netflix original series, or is it a prime? I, I can't remember who's Netflix. Uh, Netflix it was being shown as an episodic in Turkey. So they had actually made money on the production side by showing it as a weekly episodic. Therefore, I, as an American consumer who had it completely as part of my subscription, was geo-blocked from watching it in a particular country because of the fact that there was another licensing um, agreement. It's not a technical issue. That's very much a licensing and legal issue. And, and I think that's the other thing our audience here needs to understand is some of what you think about as DRM is driven by the licensing agreements for where particular content can be viewed. And you know, it's interesting. We get a lot of uh, questions about well, what we can, can, what can we do with DRM? But as people call and say, well, I want to implement DRM, what can we do? And my standard response is take the technology out of the question. What do you want to do? Because a lot of it is business decisions, how you want to monetize your content, how you want to protect your revenue and what decisions you want to make. And the technology is there to support it. It's a tool to implement exactly what you want to do. And if you wanted to say, well, Olga's home billing zip code is in the US. So when she travels to... I don't know, IBC next year or this year, and she wants to view her US content because her billing zip code allows her to, it should be, it's a choice that a business should be able to make. It has nothing to do with the technology, whether or not it allows it to or not. It's a business decision that, but in your example, Netflix is making because you are in Turkey and you can't view um, Orange is the New Black for reasons of um, licensing and rights and no other reason whatsoever. And then the last thing I want to mention on this uh, slide, and then we need to move on, is I did. I was surprised that we got the level of interest in sharing two episodes a month with friends. That says that you know people want a flexibility in the DRM that says kind of like the way Fair Play works. Look, I can I can share this with a few people for them to see because that will uh, will grow the viewership of that particular content, especially if it's an episodic. So, And here we have another in their own words uh, where we asked, um, where we pulled some sample quotes from the survey results. And Olga, I know you wanted to address these. These are 
uh, some of the, and there were dozens of these, but these are five of the features that uh, some of our respondents said they had wished for. Elga. Well, I, for, you know, purposes of time, I will um, not address the, I mean, the, the geo-blocking we kind of talked about, I think it's kind of an interesting idea that people want more geo-blocking, but then they don't want more geo-blocking, just like we saw in the slide above. Um, the two things I do want to address are more to the bottom of the page, where, um, and I'll work from, you know, bottom up, driving down the price. Uh, for me, it, when I talk about DRM, I talk about things we're more familiar with, which is a hotel room and um, a lock on the door, which is kind of sort of what DRM is. It's a lock on the door to any sort of an infrastructure. Um, and I guess my question becomes, would you want to put the cheapest lock on any door that you have, be it as you're traveling in a hotel room or at home where your family sleeps at night while you're on a business trip? Would that be the, is that what you wanna do is, is the cheapest lock on the door is what makes you happy? Or do you want a trusted brand? Do you want a trusted solution regardless of what it costs? Because you know that when you're gonna come home, your family, your possessions, your dog will still be there alive, well, and happy. And for anybody who says, let's drive down the price of DRM doesn't really think about that once you start driving down prices, you start losing features or you just lose the company altogether because we're in this to make a business, right? Um, and as people want an open DRM solution, I guess my question to them would be, who would be in charge of it? <laughs> and if we made an open source lock and there was only five possible key combinations, you know, taking the same brick and mortar approach, do you really want to put that lock on your door when a thief has five shots of getting into your house? Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that you want to have to think through from a perspective of technology of, do you really want an open source DRM where everybody has a way to get into it and figure out what, um, what you can do to hack the, the content? Um, the screen recording thing, I think is more of a, it's a software operating system um, situation. And uh, you have to think more, you know, as far as, um, screen recording, it's more of a situation where you, the output protection levels have to be exposed to the browser and to everything. And you have to make decisions about what can and cannot do um, the content record screening, whatnot. How can you not take a screenshot of a presentation that you're trying to make because you needed that, you know, that screen. It's a lot of things to think about. So we did get one question. We got two questions from the audience, one of which I may not be able to answer, but, but Olga, to your hotel analogy, mm -hmm. so that if you run a hotel, it's not your family. So you buy cheap locks and buy insurance. If something happens, do you think businesses look at cost versus safety and make that kind of a compromise when they're thinking about DRM? I think oftentimes businesses look at the cost and not think about the 20%. Um, I think that uh, we all look at, and I, I understand it. I, you know, I, I do that sometimes too, where you look at cost and you go, oh my God, this new feature is going to cost us how much? And you kind of pause. But then if you think about the fact that what is 20% of your business? I can't answer that. Everybody has a different answer. But how, if you are paying, and let's seriously say 19% of your revenue for DRM, you're making 1%, which is 1% more than you would be, um, you know, if you didn't do DRM. So decide what that number is for you and then make that decision. And if you wanna put a cheap lock on the door and then spend time hunting it down, then it's yet again, it's your choice. I can't make a choice for you. That is a good segue, Eric, to the end. Wonderful, that was a terrific discussion. We'll be posting an article on streaming media um, uh, after Streaming Media Connect that will discuss the results of this survey. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Olga, for talking about content and revenue protection. Thank you to the attendees for joining us. And uh, we do have a winner for the Amazon gift card. And that winner is Tess Decker. So Tess, someone from Streaming Media will be reaching out to you soon uh, to get you your gift card. Thanks again for joining us and join us again in a half an hour when Tim will be back and we'll be talking about latency. See you soon.